so-called presidential debates, and I insist that they be so-called. Um, <laughs> this, this real debate, you do not have to sit on your hands. You can applaud points you like. In fact, we encourage it. It will tell these debaters how they're doing, and it will also tell people you know, in the next century who are listening to this podcast that you are all here tonight. So I encourage you to voice your approval of points you like. However, the reverse is not true. Um, we really like to keep things positive and civil and on the up and up, and so we discourage, strongly discourage, booing and hissing. Um, if, you, if you really don't like a point, I'm fine with a sort of sardonic chuckle, perhaps. To, uh, to register your disapproval, but try to keep it positive. Now, we will have you vote on the motions before the debate begins. Uh, and we're, the way we're going to do that tonight, we're uh, introducing new technology. You have to have a mobile device, and the instructions for how to vote are in your program, but I'll go through them briefly. You go to your mobile device, and you open a web browser, and you type in iq 2 us Dot org. I'm sure it'll be put up on the screen in a moment, iq2us.org slash vote. I'll repeat it again, iq2us.org slash vote. And you will be pre presented with the four resolutions that we will be debating tonight in order. You've there is a Wi-Fi instruction in the back of the program in case you can't get a signal, by the way. You can get into the Wi-Fi that's in the room here to improve your signal. Our four motions are these. Motion, resolution number one, Trump is making China great again. <laughs> yes or no will be your vote. Our second resolution, the U.S. should play hardball with China on trade. Yes or no. Our third resolution, the U.S. and China can forge a grand bargain to contain North Korea. Again, it's yes, no. And finally, China is destined for regional dominance. When you use this voting uh, method, you will be asked once you make your selection, yes or no, are you sure? So that's your last chance to correct a vote in case you push the wrong button. Once you press, are you sure, you've gone into the system. We're going to keep this open for a little bit of time so that uh, if you need a little bit of time to complete the voting, you can catch up as the evening proceeds. But by, by about halfway through, we would have locked it out. So one other thing, um, because we are, I want to explain that because we are uh, going to be produced as a radio broadcast also that will be heard on public radio stations across the country and as a podcast, there are certain things that I'll need to do as matters of radio formality, like take breaks that aren't real. I'll say things like, I'll be right back, but I won't go anywhere. Um, I'll still be here and I'll say things like, welcome back. And you'll be asking, where did we go? So I just want to ask you to roll with those uh, so you can see how we do this. And th the last thing is, uh, at various times throughout the evening, I am going to ask for your spontaneous applause um, to help us um, uh, do these entrances and exits. So if you can be really robust when I do one of these, that's sort of the signal, can we have a round of applause? Uh, I would really appreciate it. And we can begin with that right now. Let's start the program with a round of applause from all of you. Let's begin, and let's begin with a proverb from China that is centered on questions of power. It goes like this. It is easy to find a thousand soldiers, but it's hard to find one good general. Welcome, I'm John Donvan, host of Intelligence Squared US, and that proverb coming from China helps set up this program tonight, not only because we are going to be debating Chinese power and what America's response should be to it, but also because to launch this particular season, we are headlining this program with a conversation, a conversation with, as the proverb from China recommends, one good general. Get ready for a strategic discussion of America's challenges around the globe, really around the world, led by General David Petraeus, who will be in conversation with Max Boot, the noted uh, military historian and also a good friend of Intelligence Squared US, whose upcoming book is called The Road Not Taken, Edward Lansdale and the American Tragedy in Vietnam. Please welcome David Petraeus and Max Boot. Hi, Max. General, thank, thank you, you very much. 
Gentlemen, you have 30 minutes for this fascinating conversation. I will be back when the clock runs out. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's always a uh, privilege to be here with one of the people that I uh, most admire in the world, uh, somebody who uh, I think better than okay. Mike not working. After all that complicated uh, zigging around backstage, Mike is not working. Okay? I will await a uh, technical fix then. Otherwise, I will wind up uh, having to scream really loudly. But my mic is working. Oh, yeah. So, so have no fear. Uh, Max, it really is a privilege to Show be here to with you on stage <laughs> once again. Uh, congratulations, on, uh, congratulations on the new book. Yep. Uh, the first question, as I recall, that you were going to ask me. <laughs> well, hold on a second. Let me see if they're actually going to fix my mic or if this will be a conversation of time. Does that thing have to be in your ear over there, or is that a problem? Yeah, he's still off. Stop the clock, please. Oh, they have. Thank you. That's good. Right. We don't want to rob you. Is this working or no? Yes? Yes, it is. All right. Woo. We have sound. All right. I was afraid I was going to be a very frustrated interviewer here. Uh, anyway, first off, let me, let me finish my praise of you, then you can... Oh, uh, please. I'm going to blush. Uh, <laughs> you can never have too much of it, no matter how, how wildly accomplished you are. But I was just going to very briefly say that you know, General Petraeus is really one of the people I admire most in the world. And I think, you know, out of all of the Americans who have served in uniform and, and served so valiantly, I think very few have managed to combine uh, the, the technical side of warfare tactics and operations with the broader grand strategy and diplomacy and, and communications and all those other higher elements of command. And I think really nobody in an American uniform has done that better uh, since the days of Dwight D. Eisenhower than the man who I am privileged to, uh, to interview you. here tonight. It was a privilege. Thank you. Okay. So with that, let's, let's jump into our conversation. The topic here tonight is China, but before we get to China, I'm going to ask uh, General Petraeus a few questions about the broader foreign policy world, starting with the most obvious question in the universe, which is, what do you think about the, the Trump foreign policy? And is there a distinctive uh, Trump policy? Is there a distinctive Trump doctrine? Well, I think it's still emerging, obviously. Uh, and you have to keep in mind that in the United States, the foreign policy is made, not just contributed or influenced by, but made not just by the president and the executive branch, uh, un but unlike a parliamentary system, the legislative branch here really can affect it. And you saw that with the sanctions on Russia, which the president really didn't want, but did sign uh, ultimately. Um, so you, what you're seeing is for six months, and perhaps interesting to some, I would contend that we're, you would characterize this more as continuity than change, with three specific uh, exceptions to that, again, possibly, because it's still emerging, and then one quite significant one. Uh, but let's just review, you know, he, he criticized the relationship with China, uh, took a call from the Taiwanese president, first time in decades, tweeted about it afterwards, uh, and then ultimately called President Xi, embraced the One China policy, had the Mar-a-Lago summit, and is engaged in fairly st uh, strategic dialogue between several different groups that were established as an outcome of that. Uh, he sort of said, well, one state, two state, whatever they want, eh. When P President Netanyahu was sitting next to him in the Oval Office the next day, uh, Ambassador Haley says this, the policy of the United States is the two-state solution. And again, you've had this on and on with, uh, you know, the Iran nuclear agreement has grudgingly perhaps, but has continued to certify that. We'll see what happens in the next round. But you can go down issue after issue, NATO, uh, whatever, critical at times during the campaign, not unlike some other candidates and some other campaigns, but perhaps a bit more so here, but ultimately coming back to the norm with the exception of trade, of course, pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a very, very big deal, as Joe Biden might have said. Um, and then also uh, with immigration, perhaps uh, there is, we, you know, you had the Mexican ban certainly softened, halted by the courts. We'll see if there's any lasting implication of that, whether there really is a limitation on the number of immigrants that can come in, what happens with H-1B visa, what happens with uh, unskilled labor, still to be, be seen. And by the way, back to trade, NAFTA, the, the negotiations are going on, and I think quite a sensible 
uh, way so far. Um, and then finally, uh, you also have one other issue, and that's climate. Uh, pulled out of the Paris Accord, uh, or will pull out in 2020. Uh, that is very significant symbolically that the United States will not continue to exercise leadership in the world on a very important issue, uh, but substantively probably not a huge difference. Uh, the, uh, what we committed to, frankly, was quite achievable. It's part of, you know, every country was able to design its own commitment. And frankly, it's going to be achieved because of businesses, because of states, and because of local communities that realize that this is the smart thing to do as well as the right thing to do. There is one big issue that I think actually is, again, still emerging, and that is the seeming ambivalence at times uh, from the president, uh, but sometimes also not, uh, about whether or not to have the U.S. continue to lead the rules-based international system that we helped bring into existence in the wake of a 50-year period that included two ruinous world wars and the Great Depression. That system, frankly, for all of its shortcomings, the international organizations, the, uh, the Bretton Woods financial institutions and all the rest, lots to criticize, lots to complain about, but generally has served the world uh, pretty good, pretty well in, in the intervening period. Um, and in fact, it has not only just helped us and our allies and partners, it's actually helped China. Arguably, no country has benefited more from it because no country has ever achieved what China did over a two-decade period of double-digit GDP growth year on year, every year in that roughly 20-year period with maybe one exception. So ag again, I think still very much emerging. That last issue that I talked about is a very, very big deal. Uh, and that's, we'll have to see. That's a big exception to the trend of continuity, it, potentially. It is, except that you have uh, McMaster and, uh, and uh, uh, Cohen uh, writing op-eds saying that the U.S. will continue to lead. You have advisors all around him who very much are continued, uh, committed to continue to lead. And so we'll have to see again how this does evolve. Uh, the president, I think, has shown a commendable willingness uh, to, to acknowledge that he was uh, unfavorable towards certain recommendations, but ultimately, over time, as most recently with the Afghanistan policy, I think has been quite good, frankly, on the ISIS uh, and anti-extremist uh, uh, endeavor. Uh, the Syrians, Bashar al-Assad's forces used chemical weapons on his people, and, you know, there's no, no ambivalence there 36 hours later. 50 cruise missiles hit, hit the air base from which those were launched. Um, so again, uh, some areas of change, one potentially very significant one, depending on how it evolves. But actually, if you tick down all of the different issues, probably more continuity than change. What do you think is the impact abroad of some of the president's, let's say, unusual behavior at home? And I'm thinking, you know, the, the kind of uninhibited tweeting, the attacks on the press, which he calls the enemy of the American people, the hesitation to condemn white supremacists, the pardon of Sheriff Arpaio, some of the, these other things that cause so much controversy at home. What impact, if any, does that have abroad on the U.S. role? Well, it, obviously, it, it causes people to, to question, uh, again, consistency, commitment to values that we have long promoted for the rest of the world uh, and the rest of this, keeping in mind that this is a president who truly actually believes in doing what he wrote in his book uh, about doing, which is before you negotiate with somebody else, you punch the other guy in the nose before you even sit down, and who sees value in, in some cases, a lack of consistency, uh, who wants the other side off balance. So, and there is some merit to this. You can actually argue, perhaps you can argue that, that, that there's some merit to that in business. You can argue, perhaps there's some merit uh, to it in international relations, although it obviously can go too far. My concern there with the so-called, you know, there's this madman theory that actually Nixon put forward through Kissinger, where he had Kissinger tell the Soviets, you know, Nixon's under a lot of pressure right now, and you know, he drinks at night sometimes, so you guys ought to be real careful. Yeah, Nixon, don't, Nixon thought, don't, that, don't, Nixon thought don't that the madman... Don't push into a crisis. I mean, Nixon thought the madman theory would scare North Vietnam into making peace, and it did not work. Yeah, and, and what I was about to say is that there may, again, be some merit into the madman theory until you get in a crisis. But you do not want the other side thinking you are, you are irrational in a crisis. This is called crisis instability uh, as opposed to pre-crisis uh, situations. 
you do not want the other side thinking that you might be sufficiently uh, irrational t to conduct a first strike or to do something, you know, the so-called unthinkable. So again, there are some benefits to some of this. There are certainly some drawbacks as well. And I think consistency in messaging uh, has not uh, been a distinguishing feature so far. In fact, there's been a little bit of message discipline issue from time to time. Nicely understated. Um, <laughs> I mean, it does seem like uh, the president believes uh, in basically the art of the bluff. I mean, he, he's, no, there's no he question says about a it. lot of things yep. that are kind of over the top. Yep. We're going to rain fire and fury yep. on North Korea and so forth. Yep. And I guess the issue is whether that's helpful or ultimately it's going to yeah. undermine our credibility. That's exactly right. And then also in individual relationships. Um, you know, how far can you push somebody else? You, you again, perhaps his work to some degree in his career, apparently. Uh, again, it's something he wrote about and he, he does believe in doing it. And again, there are some arguments that can be made for some of this. The question is, when do you do something that is non-biodegradable, as we used to say, in a personal relationship with another leader? And by the way, he has been very assiduous in reaching out to, to he loves working the phones. Uh, and there's some merit in that. If you're the President of the United States and you're willing to call a lot of these different leaders around the world, uh, I can tell you I've seen different situations. I've served presidents from both parties. I'm truly apolitical, don't vote. Uh, been confirmed in political appointee positions, or at least confirmed in positions uh, under presidents of both parties. What do you think about the fact that, you know, a, this is truly unprecedented that we've actually been able to read the transcripts of some of his phone calls with the Prime Minister of Australia or the uh, President of the Philippines? I mean, certainly the amount of information we're getting, a lot of which is is, is not very it's flattering a, the, to him. The, is, the is, ship of state is leaky, yes. although I think with uh, General Kelly there that there has already been a notab notable uh, level of discipline to processes to, again, consistency of message, message discipline, if you will, uh, and a variety of other uh, activities in the White House. There's been some concern raised, including by some former military folks, about how many retired generals are in such prominent positions in this administration, including, of course, Jim Mattis at Defense, H.R. McMaster at the NSC, uh, John Kelly as, as White House Chief of Staff. I mean, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends on the generals. Uh, and the truth is that we have seen this over time. We've had generals who have been secretaries of state, some of them pretty exceptional, like George C. Marshall. Um, we've had some others that didn't uh, last a full term. Uh, in fact, maybe lasted a year or so. The same with national security advisors, some great ones, Brent Scowcroft would come to mind, uh, and then some others that again have moved through the revolving door pretty rapidly. I think the key is to recognize that this generation of general officers, and look, every single one of them, you know, we served together on the battlefield, many of them worked directly for me, H.R. McMaster and his deputy, Ricky Waddell, who is not only a Rhodes Scholar, top of his class from West Point, Columbia PhD, and successful businessman, but a major general in the U.S. Army Reserve, and we brought him on active duty in Iraq and Afghanistan. These generals know that every problem out there is not a nail, and you just can't find a bigger hammer. In fact, you generally need a stiletto and a comprehensive approach. Uh, among the many lessons of the last 15 years, which I'd like to recount very, very quickly, uh, is one that requires a comprehensive approach. The, this is a fighting Islamist extremists. I think there's five lessons we should have learned. Uh, one is uh, that ungoverned spaces in the Muslim world will be exploited by extremists. The second is uh, that you have to do something about it because Las Vegas rules don't apply in these areas. What happens there does not stay there. Uh, the third is that in doing something, the U.S. has to lead because we uniquely have the assets that are proving to be revolutionary in enabling us to fight extremists using other countries' troops on the front lines, we are advising and assisting others in enabling with this armada of unmanned aerial vehicles that, that a bunch of commanders in Iraq and Afghanistan and I very much sought more of through Secretary Gates, who is very supportive. And we now have those, and they're extraordinary. But it's not just the platform, by the way. It's the 150 per people per each of the predators and reapers in the Air Force that make them so capable. The industrial strength fusion of intelligence, hugely important, and then the precision strike assets. The fourth is that in taking action, you have to recognize the paradox that you cannot counter terrorists like the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda 
with just counter terrorist force operations. You can't just drone strike or Delta Force raid your way out of this problem. It takes a comprehensive approach. And that's what these generals very much know. It takes all of the above, not just military, but, but diplomatic and development and homeland security folks for a whole variety of different tasks. Again, the FBI, the intelligence community, all of these have to be pulled together for a comprehensive approach. As you know well, the surge in Iraq that mattered most was the surge of ideas, the change in strategy. It was how are we going to squeeze the life out of uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq and the Sunni insurgents? And we did it with everything, including pol political uh, initiatives, reconciliation, uh, rule of law, uh, hearts and minds, but also more bombs and more raids uh, than before as well. It takes all of that. These generals know that. The fifth one, by the way, is pretty important. That is that we are engaged in a generational struggle, and that means not something going to be solved in a year or even a decade. It's going to require a sustained commitment, and in view of that, it has to be a sustainable, sustained commitment. I think we are actually proving to be able to do some of that by the use uh, of these different assets that I mentioned. And that is, again, quite a revolutionary development. Well, given the emphasis that I think you rightly put on non-military lines of operations, how concerned are you about the fact that uh, so many of the uh, posts at the State Department are currently unfilled, that, that, is that we don't have the frontline sure. diplomats no, out that, there? I think that's, that's a big concern. Again, we've got a difference out, quite a significant difference, as an example, between the Saudis and the Emiratis on one side and the Qataris on the other. Um, who's our Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East? Actually, he's not, he's an acting. In fact, he just replaced the guy who was the acting who actually retired from the position. Actually, David Satterfield is now in position, superb diplomat, but he needs to be confirmed. He needs to have the authority that goes along with uh, the position he's in. The same is true of all of these other locations. There's serious differences, obviously, uh, out in the Far East, the challenge of North Korea and its nuclear program, do we have an Assistant Secretary of State for, for the Far East? No, we do not. Again, an acting, and they're doing what they can, but again, it carries much more weight if the Senate has actually confirmed your appointment, if you've actually been nominated and they know you're going to be in that job for some period of time. So I know there's a push on to do that now. Uh, they did the look at, you know, how can we uh, uh, save resources and all the rest, and certainly, there, I mean, any serving ambassador would tell you there's a lot that can be done to achieve efficiency, but some of these central positions, I don't care what reform you have, they need to be filled and they will remain in position. So yes, we need to get on with that. All right, let's segue to the Far East. And yeah. uh, let me ask you uh, kind of a very broad question, which is, uh, which country do you think is going to be more powerful in the 21st century, China or India? Well, as you know, a good former economics professor, uh, I would have to say it depends. Um, and what it depends on, certainly, you know, the bet would be on China in the near term. I mean, they've done something truly revolutionary. No other country ever achieved the, the level of economic growth. That model appears to continue to work, although it doesn't quite get the same bang for the buck with infrastructure investment that drove GDP because you've done so much of it. Uh, moving from the country to the city, a little bit more difficult if you, if you don't have all the additional jobs for unskilled labor. Uh, some of the other initiatives that they have had, but really, uh, you know, there was a great headline to an analytical piece I saw some months ago, and it said, China's great problems, dot, 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 and China's great leaders. Now, don't mistake me. Uh, there, there's some legitimate uh, differences that we might have about the state of various freedoms, uh, the economic system, even the, the uh, political system, and the ability of people to choose their own leaders or not. Uh, but the fact is that they have done something that is absolutely extraordinary, and that's going to carry them all the way through the midterm without question. Ch at, at some point, India is going to rise. It may be beginning now with the Modi reforms. This may be the Modi moment that has arrived right now. They've done the goods and services tax, which is a very significant reform of how they do business between their own states. Uh, you earlier demonetized the economy, uh, it, it, you know, just an incredible action. And by the way, he survived it politically. In fact, he did even better in the state of Gujarat, his own, he, they prevailed uh, very significantly. So he is riding quite a wave. It's a, you know, very famously fractious, difficult bureaucracy, uh, but 
that has great potential if they can get that momentum. And it's interesting to see them now working with Japan, as we mentioned backstage, because, of course, of the mutual concern uh, about the rise of China. Well, one obvious and vast difference between India and China is that India is a democracy, China is not. How significant do you think that is? Has that been an advantage or disadvantage for China, and, and what is it going to be going forward? Again, keep in mind that the system that China has is somewhat unique in the sense that for an authoritarian system, which at the end of the day I think they would even acknowledge it is, they have nonetheless had change of leadership on a schedule. It's, and it's been peaceful, it's been consensual by and large. Certainly there are moves to consolidate power. Uh, I think President Xi has been particularly impressive uh, in, in doing that. Uh, the party congress is coming up. We'll see if they continue to go along with the scheduled transition that would take place at the end of his 10 years, uh, or whether there is some maneuver or mechanism or whatever to, again, to prolong his time uh, as the president. Um, but at the end of the day, their system has worked exceedingly well. By the way, I was just back up at the Department of Social Sciences where I taught when I was uh, in, in uniform for a period of time. This is at West and Point. At West Point. Um, and it, is there any other Department of Social Sciences <laughs> place? I hear there might I be mean, a couple out there maybe, somewhere. Yeah. Maybe Princeton, you know, I mean. Um, and thank God for Harvard. I mean, everybody can't get into Princeton, so. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I was Thank actually arguing. About I, Yale, but anyway. No, no, I wouldn't touch Yale. Uh, look, there, I think there should be a resurrection of the study of comparative politics. You know, that course went away. I mean, we won. 1991, the wall came down. We turned the second largest army in the world into the fifth largest overnight into Operation Desert Storm, and we stood on top of that hill. Uh, and that, we stayed, we retained that position for a good 25 or more years until gradually we have seen the return of great power rivalries, or what, what uh, Ian Bremer talks about, the G0 uh, world, where you don't have this one colossus uh, astride the globe the way we were, preeminent economically, uh, politically, uh, with our system, and clearly uh, militarily. And now that is all being challenged uh, to varying degrees. And again, I think it is worth studying the Chinese system. I'm not advocating adopting it. But I can assure you there's a lot of other countries around the world that are studying it and saying, you know, maybe this is not all that bad. Um, and it's probably looking better all the time with the domestic chaos that we have in this country. <laughs> I would remind the audience, as always, that, you know, our country's been through a little bit of adversity before. There have been some sectarian or some, some, some very, very partisan times, if you will. Uh, I mean, the Civil War was, after all, a four-year endeavor. That was a bit of a uh, Fought between there, yes. North and South. I mean, let's not forget that not too far, f well, I guess it wasn't too far from here. The sitting Vice President of the United States shot and killed the first Secretary of the Treasury. So we've been through some tough periods before. Uh, I think it is a strength of our country. And actually, you can chronicle many others, as you well know. Uh, and uh, again, out of this, inevitably, uh, is validation of Churchill's observation that uh, you can always count on the Americans to get it right after, you know, doing everything wrong. So we'll see. Or words, to that, all the words to that right. <laughs> effect. Do you think that the, I mean, you've been fairly bullish on China. Do you think that the 21st century is destined to be the Chinese century? Are they going to overtake us and become the dominant power? Well, I think inevitably they're going, you know, a, a country of 1.3 billion people inevitably will have a larger economy than we do. Their per capita income may still be one-seventh or so. Of, I mean, there's a real question, actually, does China get rich before it gets old the way Japan did, or does it get old before it gets rich? Because, again, their per capita income is still uh, vastly lower uh, than ours. Um, but clearly, that economy is going to surpass ours at some point. It may not come quite so soon to a theater near us, uh, as they say, but we'll see. Uh, by the way, in real, real terms, in dollar, uh, real terms, in nominal growth, in each of the last three years, I believe it is, the U.S. actually outgrew China. Now, some of that is obviously because of currency fluctuations. It's going back the other way this year. Um, the political system, again, this is a renewal of great power rivalries. Uh, and there will be comparisons of our two systems, and there certainly will be 
cases of countries that are either bandwagoning with or, uh, again, uh, balancing against China in the balancing category, perhaps, with us. By the way, let's make very clear that China is our number one trading partner, but uh, they'd also acknowledge it's also our number one strategic rival. I would contend, by the way, as you know in the title of the course that I taught for three and a half years at the City University of New York Honors College was the North American Decades, which I would still contend is where we are right now, but those are probably coming to an end unless we can really uh, get our GDP growth uh, substantially higher uh, in the next few years. Um, will they top us militarily? Look, that is going to be a, a pretty steep climb. They spend one quarter of what we spend right now or less. Uh, you take all of the aircraft carriers of the world and flat deck amphibs, and we have more of them than all the rest of the world together. It's not to say they don't have near-peer capabilities in space and cyberspace, certainly uh, in area anti-access area denial capabilities in the South and East China Sea, uh, uh, their air forces, a lot of rapid improvement, and very much on the cutting edge of technology. I mean, those people that set a closed society, a society which is cutting off now the VPN access to the internet and so forth can't innovate, have obviously never been to Hangzhou uh, and, and uh, seen Alibaba or been in Beijing with Xiaomi or Baidu or some of these others. These are serious innovators, uh, and we should never get complacent about that. And, of course, they don't have to overtake us across the entire globe because we have a global military. All they're concerned about is regional predominance. Well, regional predominance right now, but already um, the Belt and Road strategy includes uh, the string of pearls, as they're called. These are the ports that go from... Southeast Asia all the way across, yeah. uh, all the way now to Djibouti in Africa uh, and, and others. They don't do underway provisioning yet. They're not that kind of deployable uh, naval maritime expeditionary force, but they're getting there. And again, first aircraft carrier, yes, it's a hand-me-down. Um, yes, it broke down, I think, in its maiden voyage, but the second keel is already laid and they're, gonna, they're going to do that. By the way, anybody who has not seen the video uh, of a bridge being erected in China within a 24-hour period, and I see some nods in the audience. It is unbelievable. It's 41 hours? Incredible to watch this. Uh, and contrast that, actually, I was just up at Harvard on Monday, contrast that with that bridge that connects Harvard main campus with the Harvard Business School, which I tell you is almost done. I think there's just a few orange cones well, left, but it's been there for five years or so. Well, I will, I will say one thing on, on behalf of the U.S., just based on a personal observation, because I happened to land a few weeks ago on the USS Nimitz in the Persian Gulf, and it was just such an amazing experience. And not it's unbelievable. Not just for the technology, yep. which, of course, is awe-inspiring, but yep. what r really struck me was talking to the crewmen, 4,800 personnel yep. aboard that ship, and the incredible know-how and skills they have to keep this little airport going in it's the middle of the water with these yep. planes taking off and landing where there's yep. always a high risk of disaster, but they do yep. it safely time and again. And it just seems like this is a skill set and a knowledge base that the U.S. Navy has developed over decades where the Chinese can certainly build the aircraft carriers yep. much harder to replicate the knowledge that makes them run. This is a generational task yeah. to build maritime aviation capability. And you should do it in an FNA 18. I assume you were in the propeller thing the that car, sort of yes. drifted down yes. instead of the, what, the manly yes. way of slamming into yeah. the deck with it the It was still like a roller coaster forward. ride, though. It is quite a roller coaster yes. ride. Uh, it, it is extraordinary what we do have. And of course, the Chinese are very keenly aware that they have had no real combat experience. And any of our leaders have had numerous tours uh, in combat, albeit not against peer competitors. But, against, but certainly very fierce and tough combat. What do you think of the, of the Graham Allison thesis? And Graham Allison is the professor yep. at the Harvard Kennedy School who just published a book called mm -hmm. Destined for War, in which he suggests that based on his historical study, that when you have a rising great power and an existing great power, that in more cases than not, the result is a conflict. So are we destined for war with China? I don't think so, uh, but we certainly ought to take steps to prevent that. Uh, some of those steps should be to maintain and in, indeed improve uh, our capability and our military readiness and all the rest of that f as a deterrent force and to exercise it and ensure that there's no ambiguity about 
uh, understanding of our capabilities, but also strategic dialogue. I'm very much from the Henry Kissinger School believing that it really does pay to sit down with a very significant high-level interlocutor, uh, one from our side, one from theirs, develop uh, at trust in each other, even if, again, the objectives are, can, may be diametrically opposed in some cases, but, but common objectives in other. Understanding their red lines, they understand ours, uh, and again, you have that level of communication. Look, we're in a different age from any of those case studies that Graham Allison's book studies, uh, which note that I think it's three quarters of the time that you have a rising power and an established power, Sparta and Athens, uh, that ultimately, as uh, they chronicled in the Peloponnesian Wars, Thucydides wrote, and inevitably they went to war, yeah. as if this is an inevitability. Look, we're in the nuclear age, and war as an inevitability, I think, should give us all a great deal of pause. We're running low on time. Let me just ask you a question that's much in the news, which is North Korea and the relationship to China. Is China going to help solve North Korea for us, or are they an obstacle in, in the way of solving it, meaning, i.e., lessening the danger from North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile programs, which combined are going to put American cities at risk very shortly? Yeah, look, I mean, they, they obviously have to be part of the solution. And all of the efforts of South Korea, Japan, by the way, I was in Tokyo the day that we had the missile fly over. Uh, it was our first day over there. I thought it was welcome back to the Far East, General Petraeus. Um, or a salute, you know, it was a flyover. 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 Um, look, they have to be part of the solution. And again, those two countries and the United States and other countries that are involved in that region are all... Uh, in the process of taking steps to both defend uh, more effectively against possible threats from North Korea, but also to send signals to China uh, that this really is serious and we really do need them to enforce the sanctions. And we're going to have to do the same thing with Russia because that can be a sanctions buster or a workaround uh, for some of those uh, items that China will prevent from going into their country, such as coal, perhaps textiles now some petroleum products. So this, uh, again, this is the threat of the day. Uh, I, I think it's valid for the uh, administration to look at this differently than any other administration because on his watch, uh, a madman, who I don't think is suicidal, but, but some may, uh, will have a capability to hold at risk an American city, at least on the West Coast and maybe all the way into the Midwest of the United States. And the size of that last uh, explosion, the, the nuclear test, was now it may have been as much as 20 times the size of uh, the Hiroshima bomb. Uh, earlier it was assessed to be 8 to 10 times. They're revising that upward. Uh, that's a very scary prospect. Uh, and again, we're going to have to bring everything to bear uh, to get China to realize that it's in their interest uh, to force him to come to the table. And when there were really effective sanctions in the past, at one point in time, they did come to the table. Sanctions do work. We saw Iran come to the table as well because the sanctions. They came to the table, but we'll didn't necessarily keep their commitments. Gentlemen? Yes, I think Sorry. we are we are getting the hook here. We could we could sit here all day, but I it's, think Max, I it's thank you as, as always. Zero. Yeah, I, I looked something it is up. Always uh, a pleasure. General General really? George Washington had a thing about punctuality, and apparently one time his secretary showed up late and explain that his watch wasn't working, and General Washington said, well, you're either going to have to get a new watch or I'm going to have to get a new secretary. <laughs> and what I don't want to have us do is get a new host. So I'm going to thank you right, both thank for you hitting much. time, and thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Um, uh, this is, I'm stepping outside of the program for a moment. We need to fess up to something. Apparently our Wi-Fi has crashed. So if you've had difficulty voting, that is why. Uh, have, have people experienced that, or have you been able to? Yes, OK. So here's what I'm going to say. Um, we're not going to have to hand out candles or anything like that. But when you, when you go home tonight, go, go back to this site and, and just vote to tell us how, how you went with it. We apologize for it. Uh, blame me. Um, but uh, we, we were working on trying to fix it, and we're not going to. And in any case, um, what, what we're really hoping for is that uh, you're going to benefit from hearing great debate rather than the question of who wins or loses. We'll be curious to know how you feel, change your minds or not. We'll maybe check in with you on that a little bit afterwards. But first, we want to move on to the next round. So let's please welcome our debaters to the stage.
And as they take a seat, once again, um, I'm going to ask you in a moment, once they're seated, for your applause to, to sort of launch this section. And please forgive me again when you hear me do bits of radio business, like taking breaks that don't exist. Um, but that's all going to work. So if you could please give me a round of applause. Thanks. And now on to our debate about China, a country which you just heard David Petraeus explain uh, is a country that's done extraordinary things in the past 25 years. And they also mentioned Graham Allison, the Harvard historian. And if you were a student in Graham Allison's class, you would get a quiz on your first day of class asking you to guess this. In what year did Ch will China overtake the United States as the world's largest auto market? A second question, in what year will China become the number one market for luxury goods? And in what year will it become the world's leading market for all goods overall? The correct answer to all three questions, to the shock of most students, is that China is already first in all of these categories and has been for years. And if you didn't know that, then welcome to the club of underpaid attention. But boy, is attention being paid now as China gets bigger, not just economically, but also in significant ways militarily as well. Soft power and hard power. China is growing them both. Which means what for the US? Well, that is a complicated question or set of questions which we will be debating tonight. Our theme, unresolved face off with China. We have four debaters. They will each be flying solo, taking stands for and against the positions in our stated resolutions to see how far we can get in resolving the unresolved. Let's please meet our debaters. Please welcome first Ian Bremmer. Ian, welcome back to Intelligence Squared. You are the president and founder of the Eurasia Group. That's a global risk and consulting firm. And Ian, you have famously predicted that Donald Trump will get the full eight years in office. And yet, Donald Trump called you fake news. <laughs> so I guess it's fake except for the eight years part. Is that how it works? I, I suspect he's forgotten uh, about that, that one comment. But uh, you know, if, if, if you ask me, is an incumbent going to come in again on balance, I think that's a good bet. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Ian Bremmer. Our next debater, please welcome Elizabeth Economy. Elizabeth is, uh, go, yeah. Elizabeth, you have a book coming out. It's called The Third Revolution, Xi Jinping and the Rise of the Chinese State. Not only are you the Director of Asia Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and the CV Star Senior Fellow, but you were decades ahead of most of the field when you began focusing on China as an environmental story way, way back. And how has the story changed since you first got interested in it? Um, well, I guess uh, if I were going to uh, title my uh, book on the environment now, I probably wouldn't title it The River Runs Black. Uh, I might title it The River Doesn't Run Anymore wow. uh, because uh, China has lost more than uh, half of its 50,000-odd uh, rivers over the past few decades. Uh, but I will say that I, I think uh, for the first time maybe the Chinese leadership has uh, the understanding and the capacity and the will to make a difference. So I am for the first time in all those decades pretty optimistic. Okay, thanks Elizabeth Economy. <laughs> Our next debater, please welcome Noah Feldman. For you too, Noah, welcome back to Intelligence Squared. You're a professor at Harvard Law and you're a contributing writer for Bloomberg View. Uh, you have titled your book about global competition, Cool War. So we all know what a hot war is and we're familiar with the Cold War. Define Cool War for us. Well, a Cool War is when you have geopolitical struggle, as does exist between the US and China, but at the same time, you have deep cooperation and mutual dependence on the economic front. So when you've got both of those things happening at the same time, you need to be somewhere in the middle between hot and cold, and I like, settled on Like cool. frenemies kind of thing? Yeah, it's a bit, a bit like frenemies, or imagine a, a relationship you just can't get out of. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Noah Feldman. <laughs> and our fourth debater, please welcome David Schambaugh. David, welcome to Intelligence Squared. You are the Gaston Singer Professor of Asian Studies, Political Science, and International Affairs, and Director of the China, China Policy Program at George Washington University. 
Uh, you've written a lot about contemporary China, including your most recent book, uh, China's Future. We learned that you and your wife, Ingrid, are both non-native Chinese speakers, and you let, met, though, when you were both actually learning the language together, and now Ingrid teaches Chinese. So do you two find occasion to speak Chinese at home together? <laughs> Uh, not too much, as, as you just <laughs> mentioned. She teaches Chinese five days a week. I use it in my research and when I meet my Chinese colleagues. So by the time we come home, I think that's the last language we re really want to speak. <laughs> but I, I must say that uh, when we uh, did use it, it's uh, when we didn't want our, our two boys to understand us. And, and then the younger son started studying Chinese, and so now he understands oh, us. Oh, there so. goes that. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, David Shamba and our panel of debaters. And to remind you of how this is going to work, we will be working through a series of resolutions, one at a time. For each motion, the debaters will declare yes or no to the statement, and they will have one minute to tell you where they stand. Our first speaker will be Ian Bremer, and then the order will go clockwise. Let's move to our first resolution. With a man inspired, with a motion, with a resolution inspired by the man who tweets from the White House, the Chinese government has labeled emotional venting that should stop. Those tweets are not stopping. Our first motion declares, Trump is making China great again. Ian Bremer, on that motion, how do you declare yes or no? You're a no. I'm a no. Uh, you have one minute to explain I, your point. I think China's making China great again. I, I think that's very clear. Uh, certainly in terms of the relative stability that we have under Xi Jinping, uh, the comparative happiness of the average Chinese and support for their government, which I think is higher than the average American for the American government these days. But Trump himself is not making China great again. Uh, the Chinese really want stability. And there's no question it's true that because the Americans are leaving the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Americans are leaving the Paris Climate Accord, that creates some space for China. But China would much rather have stability and also have more time to keep their head low. Just keep building, focus on stability, spend the money with One Belt, One Road, all the rest. With the concerns around North Korea, with all the allies wondering what's going to happen in their future, they're thinking about alternatives, hence Japan and India increasingly together, hence concerns that the North Koreans are going to blow things up, driving South Korea into focusing on more security, Japan too. That's None of that time. is good for China. Ian, that's your time. Thank you very much. The motion, uh, the resolution again, Trump is making China... Great again, Liz Economy, how do you declare yes or no? I am also a no, but for very different reasons. Uh, I think that this is a popular notion uh, that is uh, fundamentally flawed. Uh, President Trump may be crippling uh, U.S. prestige uh, and influence globally, may be diminishing U.S. greatness, uh, but this doesn't make China great. Uh, greatness uh, is not a zero-sum game. Uh, there's not a definable quality of, uh, quantity of greatness that can shift from one country to another. Uh, it's not like U.S. greatness goes down and Chinese greatness uh, goes up. Uh, greatness has to be earned. Uh, as Winston Churchill said, the price of greatness is responsibility. Uh, and that means that China needs to be able to look beyond its narrow self-interest uh, to embrace and address the needs of others. Uh, it needs to be ready to step up to the plate uh, to forge an international agreement uh, when you're faced with a global threat uh, or a global challenge. Uh, thus far, we haven't seen China do much of this. Uh, so President Trump can't uh, make China great again. Only China can make it great again. But Thank thus you. far, China hasn't done that. Thank you. There's actually supposed to be a tone that boops yes, when, you're out, so. when you're That's out great. of town, but maybe it's connected to the <laughs> Wi-Fi tonight. <laughs> Let's move on to Noah Feldman. On the motion, Trump is making China great again. Noah Feldman, how do you declare yes or no? I declare yes. When you walk away from global leadership in a very open and public way, i.e. you tell people, I'm not interested in leading you, I want to make my own country great again, you create a huge vacuum. And there's pressure on somebody else to step into that vacuum, especially if, like China, that entity would benefit from stability. So that means there's a stability gap. China is obligated, whether they would like to or not, to step into that gap. And we see that with the way that Xi Jinping has been taking global leadership on a range of issues, or at least presenting himself as taking global leadership. Second, and even more concretely, when it comes to our historic allies in Asia, in the Pacific, who rely on us for security, uh, our current president has, unfortunately, sent a message to them 
that our guarantees of security are not as strong as they have been in the past. And they hear that loud and clear, and they too are obligated to react to that. And so they have to look inevitably at closer relations with China, perhaps economically, uh, in order to try to assure their stability that way. So a gap will be filled. There's that beep. Very effective. Very, it silenced you, didn't it? No. <laughs> David Shamba, on the motion, Trump is making China great again. How do you declare yes or no? I'm also a no. Um, Trump could help for the reasons uh, that Noah just indicated. I agree with him there. But it's up to China to make itself great again, as, as Ian, Ian said. This is a long-term project for the Chinese, uh, a 200-year project, really, or since the 1870s is when they began their effort to rejuvenate themselves after, after a couple hundred bad years. They call the centuries of shame and humiliation. But greatness, I would just note, is measured not just by capabilities, but by attraction and uh, th whether others uh, seek to emulate you. This is Joseph Nye's concept of soft power, of course. So uh, I would look at China um, and ask, is China a model for others? And I find that it is not a model for others. It's a sui generis country. Um, very much out for itself. The question is, if you're going to be a great power, you have to be magnanimous, amongst other things. And it's an open question whether China can be magnanimous. Thank you, and time is up. All right, now we're going to chat for about 14 to 15 minutes on this. We have three no's and one yes. Noah Feldman, as the yes, you're going to find yourself probably giving a little bit more time than the others because you'll be in a responsive position. Uh, but I want to take to you the question that all three of your uh, now opponents in this particular round take the position that greatness is uh, something, as Liz Economy said, needs to be earned. And David Schombaugh said, greatness is something uh, who's, that is signaled when it, uh, there are attempts to emulate it. And there's very little attempt to emulate China. Therefore, there's no greatness even in play here, whether Trump's involved or not. Can you take that on? Yeah, I mean, sometimes Shakespeare put it best. This is one of those examples. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, some have greatness thrust upon them. It's not true that global greatness is totally an internal product. It involves, unquestionably, internal action. You need to be stable. You need to at least appear to be magnanimous. Um, you need to not pretend not to be. Um, but under circumstances where the world is looking for stability, where the region as well is looking for stability, there will be an impulse from outside to demand some forms of leadership. And China may find itself with little choice but to adopt a position that we associate with greatness, with a great power, simply because of our self-conscious attempt to absent ourselves from that space. So I'm not disagreeing that a country to be great must do things on its own, but I'm making the point that greatness is not only what you do, it's also what happens around you. Ian Bremer to respond? It's too early to have greatness thrust upon China. Uh, America remains the world's only superpower. China's not close. Economically, certainly they have cash and they're spending it and they can direct it. Uh, but in terms of the diplomatic capabilities, you watch them in the G20 when they're kind of sitting by themselves and everyone else knows each other, not even close. Uh, you talk about their mili cap military capabilities, they're at best a regional power. Um, you talk about their technological capabilities, they're investing, they will get there over the long term, I believe, but they are not there yet. Anyone that saw Xi Jinping giving the big keynote at Davos this last year where he was the one saying, we support free trade and globalization, the people in the audience were like, well, that's new, but it doesn't in any way reflect the China we know that doesn't have rule of law, that doesn't actually have an independent judiciary, and that doesn't actually practice what they preach. So this is a very serious problem, and I would argue that, yes, Shakespeare's correct um, if you're actually the man with the plan and just waiting, and there it is. This is far too early for China to have great interest. Liz Economy. Yeah, let me just um, point out that if we look back uh, pre-Trump, uh, to China's reaction uh, to the Ebola crisis or even to global climate change. Uh, it did not step up to the plate. It had to be cajoled, it had to be berated uh, into doing more. Uh, we look now, uh, post-Trump, uh, and see that when the U.S. stepped back in, in the face of the Muslim refugee crisis, you know, Canada stepped up, Germany stepped up, but China was nowhere to be seen. Uh, so it's not as though China has the opportunity now. There are many opportunities for China to step up, but what we see is that other countries are stepping into the breach. Other countries are being the responsible powers, the great powers to some respect. It's not China. 
All right, I'm going to go to Noah and then come to you, David, for, so Noah, to respond to some of what you've heard since your position's being hit. Well, I, I don't disagree that it's too soon, as, as Ian says, but sometimes a country is not, uh, excuse me, a country is not completely prepared for the stance that it's nevertheless obligated to take on. Arguably, World War I was too soon for the United States to have to get involved in Europe to try to resolve uh, the war toward, towards its end, but there was little choice but to do so. And so I think, you know, great power status can be achieved slowly, and it can be achieved step by step. Was the United States a great power after World War I? I mean, in some sense, we as Americans imagine that the answer must be yes, but globally, arguably, that wasn't yet true. Maybe they, they were a regional power. Our economy was not well developed. Were we a world leader with respect to humanitarianism at the time? No. Were we anywhere close to Britain? No. But we were on a trajectory that led us into a position of greatness. Again, not entirely of our own choosing, although partly of our own choosing. And so, to Liz's points, I, I agree that it will be issue by issue. I agree that China will not follow our playbook for what a great country is. They will follow their own playbook for what that is, and they will do it on a slower and I think more openly self-interested basis. Let me bring in David Chamba. And, and, and David, you, in, to a degree, um, um, Noah is arguing that vacuums have been created by the Trump administration withdrawal from, say, TPP uh, on Paris Accords. Um, Ian has already quoted uh, uh, the Chinese president at Davos talking about we are going to lead mm -hmm. uh, on free trade. Are, are, are those things ra relatively meaningless in terms of China having an opportunity to move into the position of greatness? Well, vacuums uh, do provide China an opportunity. I just came back from six months of living in Southeast Asia, and, I, and uh, the six months, of course, when Trump has entered office and pulled out of TPP, there is a tremendous vacuum the United States under Trump is leaving in Southeast Asia, and all those countries, every single one of them except Indonesia, is gravitating towards China. I think your mic just stopped. If you, if you can count to three, I'll see if I can hear. Does any, is everybody else's mic live? Yeah, that's okay. I'll step up and say they're not really all gravitating well, toward China. No, I just, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd just take advantage but of the moment and shut you down. That was such a good point from my perspective. I, I was know. about to, you know, claim victory. <laughs> no, We're going to no, rush out here and fix it. Okay. You take a look at the Are you back up polls or? and you'll no, see that's not actually so. the case. Uh, Do we have a handheld mic we could bring out just uh, for the moment? Some, somebody's going to come out with a handheld mic. Do you mind doing this for the rest of the night? Oh, you're, oh, you're good. I think you're back. I'm back? Nope. No. Nope. No. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, you, you are back, David? Can you? Um, I'm going to sing now. Okay, sorry. <laughs> to fill the gap. Probably. And I apologize in advance you for what you're about to hear. You see the missing. Yeah. Someone yeah. else will have to step up. It's just the way prepared. these things are structured. I am prepared. <laughs> Yeah, sure. There you go, David. <laughs> I know you've probably lost your train of thought, but you're talking about vacuums. Only in the United Well, exactly. Uh, where was I? So, vacuum, Noah, I agree with you. Uh, vacuums can uh, perhaps offer opportunities for uh, them to be filled. Um, and nature abhors vacuums, I think it said. China uh, is filling the vacuum in Southeast Asia. Um, but again, I come back to. Uh, my point about greatness. Greatness to me has to do with influence. It's not just based on a country's capabilities. And Ian has already indicated where China is a, what I used to call a partial power in one of my books. It's not there yet, except in the economic side. Um, it's a work in progress. It's going to be some time uh, before they reach that. But my real point is, are others gravitating towards China because they wish to emulate China, or they simply wish to benefit from China's economic largesse? Okay, that's different. Uh, nobody seems to be queuing up to model their political systems on China's political systems. Mm -hmm. As Liz just said, diplomatically, the Chinese are not in the middle of any crisis voluntarily. They're thrust into it, as we see with North Korea right now. But if you're a great power, you get in the middle of difficult situations. You forge coalitions. You bring others together. You lead. China puts its okay. head in the sand and hides whenever there's a crisis. Ian Bremer, you want to join in? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that actually Noah's point that greatness is being thrust upon China and Southeast Asia, to the extent that it's happening anywhere, it probably is happening there. Uh, but in Japan, which is, you know, arguably strategically more important than Southeast Asia, actually Abe's first trip uh, after Trump was elected, he was the first guy to come in and see him, even before he was president. Um, and this was because Abe was concerned that if the Americans were slipping, they needed to double down and make sure that they had a strong security relationship with the U.S., even after the Americans pulled out of TPP. 
I think despite all the problems between Trump and South Korea, the North Korean conflict has driven South Korea much more towards the United States than Trump has driven South Korea towards Beijing. And that's going to be a problem for South Korea economically, but also for the Chinese. I see Germany now worried that the United States isn't doing as much coordination on global trade between the Americans and the Europeans. The Germans are now trying to lead, along with other Europeans, a CFIUS-style policy that will actually make it harder for the Chinese to invest in Europe. Again, on all of these points, I would say that in 10 years' time, China might be capable of get breaking through this and forcing countries towards them. I think now it's more likely to hurt them. Final point here, this meeting between Abe and Modi, the Indians have not wanted to play geopolitics at all, but now they see that China, because of the vacuum, is playing a bigger role in the region and so certainly in Southeast Asia. Now the Indians are saying, we need to spend money, coordinate with the Japanese, and we need to show that China is not the only ball game. All of that stuff is ultimately causing a bunch of bumps in the road that the Chinese really are at no stage in their development to handle right now. Liz, economy to finish this yeah, round. Yeah, I would just say it's probably not fair to say that China is having greatness thrust upon it. The truth is that Xi Jinping walked in the door uh, and said, I am committed to the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, right? And he has done everything but step up and say, as Ian said at Davos, right? We are a leader in globalization. You know, stood by uh, Angela Merkel and said, you know, we are the leader on climate change without actually backing that up with significant action. You know, so I think that he, he's put himself out there as a leader, but he hasn't actually led. Well, he's just lucky that Trump's leaving the stage to him then. But he's not leaving the stage to him because he's not prepared to do anything. That concludes this round. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Actually, I want to, if, if you would bear with me, I want to um, change my vocabulary um, again for the radio broadcast. So get ready to applaud spontaneously when I say, and that concludes debate on this resolution. We're going to move on to the second re resolution. The resolution is the U.S. should play hardball with China on trade. The U.S. should play hardball with China on trade. First, to respond on this resolution, Elizabeth Economy, do you declare yes or no? So I declare yes, uh, game on. You have one minute. Uh, I think you know, trade is a competitive game, and, and frankly, we should play hardball with every country. Uh, we want U.S. companies to win. Uh, but we also understand that as long as uh, the field is basically open and fair, uh, that everybody's generally playing by the same rules, that the U U.S. companies are sometimes, perhaps even often, uh, going to lose. The problem with China is that it's constructed its own set of rules and its own game. Uh, and in this game, there is rampant intellectual property theft uh, from U.S. companies. Uh, China forces technology transfer from U.S. companies as a price of doing business in China. Uh, it massively uh, distorts uh, trade through subsidies, uh, and it restricts or it blocks U.S. companies and others uh, from investing in core sectors of the Chinese economy. You know, China joined the WTO in 2001. It's been more than 15 years that the United States and the rest of the world has waited for China to learn the rules of the game. But if China's not going to play fair, then we have to play hardball. Thank you, Liz Economy. And I just want to clarify, this resolution is about China using trade as a weapon, tactics like stopping imports of salmon from Norway and bananas from the Philippines to settle scores in political quarrels. So big is China's economy that these tactics often work and countries often cave, but should they be emulated? Again, the resolution, the U.S. should play hardball with China on trade. Noah Feldman, do you declare yes or no? I, I declare no. The time to play hardball, and there, of course there are times for that, is, you know, it requires two conditions. One, you have to be very confident that you know what you're doing and that the people in charge on your side know what they're doing. Because if you go too far, you could escalate to difficult circumstances. The second requirement is that you have to have leverage. I don't think we qualify under either of these circumstances at, at present with respect to China. I don't, frankly, trust the Trump administration to escalate tensions with China over questions of trade. Trump knows that will play well to his base. His instincts are towards protectionism. In the long run, in my view, uh, a closer trade relationship with China is a valuable thing for the United States, for reasons that I'll get to in just a moment. And uh, risking that, I think, is, is real uh, under the conditions of Trump's presidency. 
Second, we need leverage, and there, of course, we have leverage at the trade level, at the economic level, but we have less leverage with respect to geopolitics. Right now, the U.S. really needs China's help on a wide range of security issues, uh, North Korea most uh, significantly amongst them, and I really think that's a substantial, uh, substantial lack of leverage. Thank you, Noah Feldman. <laughs> David Chambaugh, the U.S. should play hardball with China on trade. Do you declare yes or no? I am also a no um, f for some of the reasons that Noah just indicated, mainly the one about escalation. Um, that would result in what's known as mutual assured destruction in the Cold War, nu in nuclear terms. This would result in mutual assured economic destruction. We are so uh, interdependent economically, and we depend on and need uh, various Chinese uh, goods in our country, and uh, they, to a lesser extent, ours in their country. So, and we believe in open uh, borders and open trade, at least we did until the Trump administration. Um, where I would play hardball, though, is on investment. It may be a fine distinction, so I'm not, I don't think we should play hardball on trade because of the escalation, but for reasons Liz has indicated, China's market is closed relatively, overwhelmingly, I'll say, closed to American investors. Uh, here we are 30 years on, and if you look at the American Chamber of Commerce uh, quarterly surveys in Beijing, 81% of American companies say they feel unwelcome in China. Thank you, David Chamba. <laughs> the U.S. should play hardball with China on trade. Ian Bremer, are you yes or no? Yes. Um, uh, this is the one that's toughest for me of the four. I'm kind of on the fence, but if you make me, I'll say yes. Look, one reason is because on North Korea, the Chinese were not going to move until the Americans really pushed. Yes, even Trump, with the potential of being a little unhinged, it got them to much harder sanctions than they otherwise would have supported. The U.S. economy is much bigger than the China's economy today. That will not be true in five or ten years' time. There is more leverage in that. If there were a trade war, we would win it, though both would take damage. That would be much more challenging in five or ten years' time. Finally, Bannon, Gorka, others are gone. So the people that are most likely to do something that would truly cause confrontation aren't making the decisions. Trump may say stuff, but people like Lighthizer, frankly, Wilbur Ross, Mattis, others that are managing the China relationship are adults. And so ultimately, I do think we're going to have to be a little tougher on the Chinese. Thank you, Ian Bremmer. <laughs> so we have two yeses and two noes. And the name Steve Bannon has come up. And I want to mention, I want to remind everybody of the interview he gave shortly before departing his position in the White House to the American Prospect, where he told Robert Kuttner that we are at economic war with China already, that we need to be, quote, maniacally focused on this because China is, quote, cutting out the heart of American in innovation, and we are five years away from losing that war. Noah Feldman, your response to that declaration of war already happening? Fortunately, I think it's not yet the case. I think, though, that... Um Notwithstanding the presence of the grown-ups that Ian mentioned, there is still one other person he didn't mention, that is the person who's going to make the decision ultimately. And, you know, I think that it's entirely possible that the view that Steve Bannon expressed there is still believed in some form by relevant decision-makers in the White House, primarily the President. Um, so, you know, that's a description of where we could end up. That's Bannon playing the political game of describing something as the case in the hopes of making it the case. Mr. Economy, your, your now opponent, temporary opponent, David Shambaugh, has argued that if, if we were to engage in the sorts of practices that China is engaged in now, that we wouldn't be doing what Americans do, which is stand up for free trade, that it, in a sense to, 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 to play hardball with China would be to be getting down in mud that we don't want to get down into. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what we've argued for 15 years, that we should be a model for China and that they will learn from us, and gradually we're going to see the Chinese economy evolve into one that looks like ours, but that's not what's happened. Right? You look back to you know, 2012, Chinese, six Chinese solar companies dominated uh, the global market. Why? Because they had huge subsidies uh, from the Chinese government. If they didn't have those, company, those subsidies, they would have been bankrupt. Right? They completely flooded our markets with their products. Uh, you know, we do have leverage. I mean, U.S. exports to China equal about two-thirds of 1% of our GDP. In contrast, Chinese exports to the U.S. equal about 4% of their GDP. You know, we, we have a lot of leverage with China right now. We can do things, and we should do things. Do you agree with Ian Bremmer, who's arguing the same side as you on this one, that the leverage will be running out, that it's temporary leverage? 
No, I don't know why we have temporary leverage. I, I do think to the other point that you were making um, about the uh, attack on the United States in terms of you know, our technology and our future, that it is a significant issue already, uh, and it will only grow. Uh, I mean, they've made huge inroads into our semiconductor industry. Uh, they're pouring $100 billion to go in and acquire firms from US, and I think, as Ian mentioned, from Germany. There's an enormous amount of concern uh, in Europe as well. Uh, so I think that it's not just about the US, it's about a lot of countries standing up and saying, this is how we do business. And China, you're too big at this point, the second or first largest economy in the world, depending on how you uh, evaluate it. Uh, you have to play by the rules that everybody else is playing by, or you're going to suffer the consequences. And I think reciprocity, right, saying our market, your market is closed in these areas, well, maybe we're not going to let you invest either, is the way to go. David Chambaugh, the response to that, the reciprocity theory. Well, just to finish uh, my point about reciprocity on investment, there is where we have leverage. And Liz just made the point, uh, or maybe it was you, John, that China's trying to become an innovative power to you know, add value and get out of the middle income trap and become a fully developed economy. Well. It, what it's trying to do is acquire certain niche technologies and some very specifically designated fields, both in Europe and here in the United States. We can vet that and we can prevent that. And we need to strengthen our uh, US government, it's called the CFIUS process, I think it was raised, um, not just over national security concerns, but over uh, technology and our comparative advantages. And we can leverage that against China for access from, for American companies in China. No, Feldman. I just want to remind everybody that the trade discussion does not happen in isolation. And the fact that we, I totally agree, have economic leverage, as I think I acknowledged from the start, doesn't mean that in the crossover linkage to the geopolitical situation, our leverage is very great at the moment. We are coming cap in hand to the Chinese on issue after issue, and most notably, again, uh, North Korea. Uh, you're right that pressure is necessary, but there's a, there's a translatability, as it were, of what you can get. And so you're picking and choosing with respect to what you can do with the leverage that you have. And my argument is simply that at present, um, our needs are so great, our wants are so great with respect to geopolitical cooperation, that those ought to outweigh in the short term taking a hard line on trade. I, I, here, I, just, I really quite disagree. I, I don't believe the Americans are going cap in hand on geopolitical cooperation. The United States has vastly more geopolitical power and influence than the Chinese do. As I already mentioned, it's driving the Japanese and the South Koreans to work much more closely, and the Chinese are deeply unhappy about it. Look, the fact is that America's North Korea policy is perhaps one of the best emblematic policies of America first. It's certainly not South Korean first. It's certainly not Japan first. It's kind of a, hey, we're going to make this a problem before it comes to the American shores. In other words, North Korea is far away, and if there's anything that really blows up there, China's going to have to deal with it much more than the United States. We actually have more leverage. Other point that's kind of more controversial is to what extent, as Bush would say, is Trump actually the decider? I mean, he's the queen, right, in the sense that we must show deference and put him on television and have him all of that but but in turn he's wanted he's been saying i want tariffs where are my tariffs they're not giving him tariffs it's insubordination right i mean in on many of these cases it does seem on national security issues and big international trade issues that trump does seem to recognize that actually the generals know a lot more than him and even though he says a lot of stuff that actually implementation of policy is a bit more mature than the headlines in the mainstream media might lead us to believe. So I'm a little less worried about that. Liz Economy. Yeah, I would just say, I think it's a mis... I'll let Ian get his applause, but I think it's a mistake uh, to, to look at this issue linkage all the time. I think you end up in a very slippery slope. There will always be something that can trump something else. Uh, I think. China has its own reasons for wanting to uh, make progress on the North Korea issue, increasingly. Uh, I know we're going to have a discussion about North Korea, and I don't want to go too far down that path, but the Chinese leadership is under enormous pressure domestically uh, to take a tougher line. So I think we shouldn't be so concerned uh, about uh, the, the North Korea going to uh, China about North Korea um, cap in hand. We're not doing that. Uh, China has its own reasons for taking action. I don't think we should be linking the two issues. We should be pushing back on the trade issue and pushing back hard. David Chambaugh, let's talk a little bit about what constitutes hardball, where you would draw the line. What's not hardball in terms of a just and uh, justified response to China's tactics? I would vet every merger and acquisition um, attempt by a Chinese company towards an, to an American technology company. That's not hardball. That is hardball. That is hardball. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, 
I would look very toughly at any investments by China in our energy sector, um, uh, near national security locations um, around the country. Um, and I would just sort of hold back the approval process, you know, the way the Chinese do with us all the time. They just keep you hanging and you never get your approval unless you're President or Ivanka Trump and then you get 60, 60 patents overnight. Um, so, you know, we just have to play the game the way they play, they've been playing it with us. But no, that's Feldman. Not the, I mean, so here we have an internal disagreement because you are arguing for hardball, but only on investment, not on trade. But I, I want to, you know, just respond to that by saying, you know, that is not in fact how investment in the United States has historically worked and has meant to work. And that's not because we're so open-minded and we're trying to improve the wealth of people over the world. It's that we've actually believed that it is in our national interest to attract capital from abroad. Right? That has always been one of our goals, and it remains one of our goals. It's one of the commitments to, to free trade. So I agree that you can situationally deploy something like that to try to get something in return. I don't dispute that. So-called greenfield investment is fine. Let them build factories. Uh, China employs 94,000 Americans right now, according to the Rhodium Group. That's great. Or maybe it's up to 120. You know, that sort of investment um, is not what I'm talking about. It's the uh, targeted uh, technology acquisition to uh, fulfill their Made in China 2025 program. That's where we and the Germans and the British and the Japanese, the global leaders, um, they're after us. And we've got to be awake, first of all, and put up barriers to prevent that acquisition. Ian Bremer, what does winnering, winning or losing a trade war look like? Look, I, I, I do agree with Xi Jinping that everyone is a loser in a trade war because ultimately there is a mutually assured economic destruction between the two countries. But I don't think playing hardball with the Chinese on trade leads you to a trade war. And in that regard, it's not mutually assured economic destruction. With nukes, mutually assured destruction, you hit someone with a nuke, it's really hard to imagine that doesn't continue to escalate. On trade, we hit the Chinese with a tariff. They hit us back usually with a tariff that is calculated very clearly to cause exactly the same amount of economic damage, but with a bunch of stuff that doesn't bother them as much. I think they have to see that we're serious, especially because, as Liz said, multinational corporations based in the US that are worth the most, the IT firms, Look at China today and say they don't think they have a future. Facebook can't get in. Even though Mark Zuckerberg learned Chinese, said that he would give a symbolic Chinese name to his child, and Xi Jinping said, that's nice, I'm not letting you in. Google, same problem. Apple, fine for now, but down the road, I think, experiencing it. These companies will not coordinate because they're competitors with each other. It's not like China. The United States government is going to have to actually provide a little bit of strategic engagement here. And that concludes debate on this resolution. <laughs>
leaves a hostile power on its border is so great that China will have to keep North Korea in place. And to keep North Korea in place at this point seems to require uh, accepting its nuclear program at least as strongly as it presently is. So I, I don't see a containment strategy in that sense. David Chambaugh, again, this resolution, the U.S. and China can forge a grand bargain to contain North Korea. Are you yes or no? I'm tempted to leave my marker like that because I'm ambivalent about the answer. You want to be answer. a maybe on this? I was going to be a no, but I'm actually going to change my uh, vote and uh, be a little provocative and vote yes. Um, the problem... We it, appreciate that since you <laughs> voted no. Thank you. Is this a debate? This is, we all know this is a real conundrum. There are no good resolutions or solutions or they would have been used and discovered already on, on North Korea. But what we haven't talked about with the Chinese, as far as I know, is a post-unification scenario. If we can persuade the Chinese in a, about a unified Korean peninsula uh, with essentially a South Korean regime uh, that does not... Uh, have American forces on it and does not necessarily have an American alliance with it, uh, that would alleviate their neuralgic national security concerns considerably. They can't stand the North Korean regime. They've had problems with the North Korean regime since June 1950 when the North attacked the South and they didn't know. It's been 50 years of hell for the Chinese with North Korea. They don't like the regime. So we have to bring them somehow to a regime transition uh, perspective uh, together. Thank you. Time is up on that. And now, Ian Bremmer, the motion, the, the resolution, the U.S. and China can forge a grand bargain to contain North Korea. Are you yes or no, Ian Bremmer? I'm going to say no, uh, in large part because I want to be with Noah on one of these. Um, <laughs> I, uh, and I think that's true. Um, uh, look, I, I, I think containing implies that we can keep them sort of where they are. And, you know, I look at what the North Koreans are now doing on cyber. Right, the WannaCry virus hit not just the U.S., but actually hit the Chinese harder. Uh, the attacks against the central bank in Bangladesh, the SWIFT codes. I don't see anything that looks like containment there. And the fact that we're talking about nukes and ICBMs in the United States and not talking about cyber from North Korea doesn't mean that this isn't a very serious problem. I agree completely with David that the North Koreans are a very serious problem for China, but also the Chinese themselves seem to be losing influence. Remember, they had the, he had the, sent the half-brother assassinated while he was under Chinese protection. I just don't think the Chinese believe they can do it, so they won't try. Thank you, Ian Bremmer. You can applaud Ian Bremmer when he finishes. Yeah. Liz Economy, once again stating the resolution, the U.S. and China can forge a grand bargain to contain North Korea. Do you declare yes or no? So, yes. In the immortal words of Bob the Builder, can we fix it? Yes, we can. So I think China and the U.S. are closer to being able to forge an agreement on North Korea than uh, at any time in the past decade. Uh, in part, I think it's because Kim Jong-un has uh, changed the facts on the ground, uh, now can launch a missile strike uh, and perhaps a nuclear uh, warhead uh, in the near future that can uh, hit the United States. Uh, and that's changed the calculus here, and the Chinese understand that. In part, it's because we have a new president uh, for whom conventional wisdom and historical knowledge uh, do not pose uh, any um, uh, restrictions. Uh, and, uh, and also, he wants all options on the table uh, and wants an agreement, uh, wants to make a deal. Uh, and in part, it's because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Chinese leadership itself is under enormous pressure. Uh, the foreign policy elite uh, want Ch the government to take a tougher line. The Chinese public are concerned about things like nuclear uh, fall radioactive fallout. Uh, and, it, uh, and there's a fear that President Trump might go rogue uh, and leave China to pick up the pieces. So what an agreement might look like is a different issue, but can Thank we you. fix it? Yes, we can. Thank you, Liz Economy. <laughs> So let me take this first to Noah Feldman. You know, we, we've just come through a period where the United Nations Security Council passed, uh, for the ninth time since 2006, they've passed sanctions against North Korea. The U.S. wanted some very, very tough sanctions. They wanted to freeze the leaders' international assets. They wanted to stop all imports of petroleum products. They didn't get that because China and Russia insisted on making it softer. What's the implication of that action by China and Russia? But right now, let's make it China uh, in terms of this question of being able to forge a grand bargain. To me, the implication is that China was willing to do the initial round of sanctions just thus far and no further. They're not willing to undertake steps that might actually put sufficient pressure on North Korea to make the regime totter. 
And that's, I think, a very significant moment for them. It's their way of saying that, yes, we're annoyed with the North Koreans, maybe more than annoyed. Yes, we're worried. Yes, we don't want regional destabilization. But we actually aren't prepared to do anything about it because fixing the problem would require steps that contradict our national interest. And, you know, we have allies like that, too, not to put too fine a point on it, um, where we might want them to do things that we would be able to, you'd think, given our level of support and commitment, I'll require them or obligate them to do. And sometimes those allies say to us, no. You know, what's your point of leverage against us? And I think this is exactly what's happening to, to the Chinese in North Korea. David Shamba, you're arguing that the bargain is doable. Mm. Uh, you change, <laughs> you're changing your mind now? <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem is the North Koreans won't go peacefully into the night. You know, so even if the Americans and the Chinese could come, and the South Koreans and Japan and the other actors could come to agreement about regime transition, um, the North Koreans aren't going to go along with it. So uh, that brings us back to square one, or intelligence squared, with Thank containment you. and sanctions and pressure. We love that uh, so, cross-promotion. Um, but I'm, I'm just trying to put on the table that we haven't uh, at least had the conversation with the Chinese whereby uh, they could be a post-unification Korea that was not threatening to China. That's what they worry about. They don't want regime collapse, A, because of the humanitarian dimension, um, B, the economic dimension, having to pick up the pieces, it cost 12 times, apparently, uh, the amount of money to rebuild the North as it did West Germany to absorb the former East Germany. Um, and uh, they don't, you know, obviously want a communist state on their periphery, one of the four remaining communist states on the planet, to go down. So, but if there are ways to sort of uh, figure out some broader transition and a, a uh, coalition government, or a phase transition between North and South. Uh, we haven't had these conversations. All right, let's bring in Liz Economy. You're right, also David. a yes on this. Yeah, David is um, absolutely right. And it's interesting that a, a noted Chinese scholar who's a friend of, of both ours has just published an article talking about the need uh, for China to have this kind of contingency planning uh, take place, Jia Qingguo. So it's an example of how, yes, the Chinese went so far and not that far with this set of negotiations, but this far is further than they went in the last round of sanctions. So you see the Chinese progressing over time in terms of the uh, severity of the sanctions that they're willing to implement on North Korea. Let's not forget that in five years of Xi Jinping's presidency, he has not met once with Kim Jong-un. There is no love lost uh, between uh, this Chinese leader uh, and Kim Jong-un. And while it's true that, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not clear that uh, Kim Jong-un will go peacefully into the night. There are other options, right? There is the decapitation option. Right, right. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that China's there yet, but, you know, it took a long time could you, for the could United States. Um, could you de-euphemize that word, decapitation? Decapitation. I was hoping not to. Literally, it was, I was, not I was it, at all. It kind of was. It kind of was. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it would mean the elimination of, of Kim Jong-un, or perhaps we just send him to Switzerland with a billion dollars, okay. and that would be a better way to, to go. Um, but I, I do think that uh, the Chinese are increasingly open uh, to, to tougher actions against uh, North Korea for their own reasons. Ian Bremer, to respond? I, I think the Rodman plan is as likely to work <laughs> <laughs> as what we just heard. Um, hey, wait a minute. Ping what? pong diplomacy goes to basketball diplomacy. Don't laugh. Uh, yeah, look, it's real. If you want to go there, feel free. I don't think that's your yes vote. But my no vote... <laughs> Um, is uh, the fact that the North Koreans understand that Gaddafi didn't have nukes, dead. Hussein, no nukes, dead. Kim Jong-un, not dead. And, you know, I, I, I look at what's in front of them, I see a guy that wants to develop an ICBM with re-entry capabilities, wants to develop a miniaturized set of nuclear warheads, wants to be in a position where truly the decapitation option is truly not on the table, and then we can do a deal. Now, that's after containment. In other words, that's containing from a bigger place. America has history with that. We told the Indians and Pakistanis, no nukes. You do nukes, we're going to have a problem with you. They do the nukes, they do the tests, we sanction them. We put serious sanctions. After, you know, 10 plus years, we pull the sanctions back. Why? Because they behaved? No, because they didn't. They broke through the containment. We're like, well, shit, we lost on that one, so I guess we got to deal with you guys now. Wait, the, did, did, you just, did you just use profanity? No. Oh. Um, <laughs> so, Good. Good. 
So this is after hours HBO like stuff, right? <laughs> so uh, my, my point is that there is absolutely, I can see into the future once the North Koreans develop a, 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 a nuclear program that they consider is sufficiently robust to avoid the decapitation, we could absolutely, with the Chinese, get to a deal. We are not there yet. David Chamba, I'll come to you after. Uh, war is not an option. Some sort of discussions need to take place uh, directly with the North, multi-party discussions. And again, I come back to the sort of unification dimension of all this. That's the one thing all parties agree on. North wants to unify, South wants to unify. Uh, the Americans are not opposed to it. The Chinese are not opposed to it. I think we need to kind of think beyond nukes, first of all. That's the American obsession, uh, and for good reason. That's not the Chinese obsession. Um, so there's a different set. They're kind of apples and oranges, and two ships sort of passing in the night, and they're not really talking beyond the immediate. Noah Feldman? I just wanted to point out directly in, in response to David's really important point that there's a structural problem with a demilitarized unified Korea that the U.S. wouldn't be defending, and that is China. Right, so whatever this entity would be, for South Korea to agree to enter it, no matter how idealistic they might be feeling that day, they're going to be aware that their entity will now be bordering China directly, and they will need a security guarantor, and that's only us. You know, there, there isn't another credible, and you know, no degree of self-protection is going to suffice against China. So to me, there's a structural problem with even beginning to imagine what a, I think you said, quasi-demilitarized unified Korea would look like. You're, you're assuming that South Korea would not want to live in a Chinese sphere of influence. No, I think they are <laughs> fully accept living in a Chinese sphere I of influence. I think they're already in a Chinese sphere yeah. of influence in economic terms. I think what they have wanted thus far, and to my mind this is the current conundrum of, of, of the Pacific generally, countries are living under the Chinese economic sphere of influence while depending on the U.S. as a security guarantor. They're playing both ends against the middle, and that has worked for those countries. Liz Economy, you're, you're again arguing, yes, you think that a grand bargain can be forged to contain North Korea. What does this bargain look like in such a way that Kim Jong-un would actually be willing to comply with it? Uh, well, first of all, I'm not sure there is a bargain that Kim Jong-un is, is willing to comply with. Um, but I do think that's that we have to... That's back to decapitation. Right, that's back to decapitation. But I do think... So you is know, that we, the grand bargain for... Uh, <laughs> it may... Hey, it may well be. Clever no, redefinition. Nobody, yeah. nobody limited the, the uh, sort of scope of options uh, moving forward. So, um, no, I, I think, look, the Chinese have put on the table the, the freeze and freeze. It doesn't seem as though the North Koreans have even picked up on that yet, right? So... Uh, Kim Jong-un would freeze uh, sort of the development of, of nuclear weapons and we would not have any more uh, military uh, exercises with South Korea for the time being. Um, I think David's right, we have to get back to the table. You may laugh at the idea of basketball diplomacy, but actually, you know, that is what broke through uh, with the Chinese, right? The ping pong diplomacy was the first thing. Maybe we have uh, a round robin tournament with North Korea, China, the United States, and South Korea. Uh, and we be begin to break the ice. Uh, and then we go into more formal talks uh, with North Korea. Uh, so, you know, and then, and then we move into, you know, United States, uh, you know, forms some sort of peace treaty, right? And then we move to uh, the United States establishing a representative office. I mean, there are many, one of the interesting things about this conundrum is that there are so many different elements to it. There are so many different things that could come into play. Uh, and I think we're finally at a point where the Chinese are actually uh, desiring to do something. And that concludes debate on this resolution. <laughs> and now the future. Given everything that we have heard so far tonight, the question that demands asking is contained in this resolution. China is destined for regional dominance. First to debate this is David Chambaugh. China is destined for regional dominance. David Chambaugh, do you declare yes or no? Turn it around and say no this time. Uh, and for two, two essential reasons. Uh, first, that others in the region uh, wouldn't stand for Chinese regional dominance. This is not the Ming Dynasty or the Song Dynasty where the tribute system uh, obtained and existed, and others uh, dutifully fell into the Chinese hierarchy. The Chinese may want that, but uh, I can tell you, with the exception of South Korea, um, not many in Asia want to go down that path. And secondly, there are, well, there are other actors of significance in the region, Japan, India, Indonesia, and indeed the United States. 
So they would balance against China. This is the iron law of international relations. Um, so I don't foresee it for that reason. The second reason I don't uh, foresee Chinese dominance is because the Chinese are very capable of overstepping and overreaching um, economically and in other ways. They are, like other, many other great powers, they are oftentimes bullying. Uh, and intimidating. And uh, I'm sorry, time is up on you. Thanks I'm very much. I'm going to have to stop there. Thank you. For... China is destined for regional dominance. Ian Bremer, do you declare yes or no? I declare no. Um, so I agree very much with what uh, David had to say. I would also focus not just on East Asia, Southeast Asia, but Central Asia. Focus on Russia. The fact that the Chinese are increasingly just dominating places like Kazakhstan, as well as economically East Siberia, and the Russians are deeply uncomfortable with it. They don't have the population, but they have the military capability. And the Chinese don't know how to manage it. One Belt, One Road, they're putting all this money in a lot of countries, but Russia, not so much. I just think, remind oh, people One Belt, One Road, what that's well, about. It's this, you know, trillion dollars that the Chinese are putting. It's kind of like their Marshall Plan, but without liberal democracy at the end. Um, and <laughs> that's a short definition. Um, the, but, but I will tell you that while I don't think they're destined for regional dominance, I think it's quite possible they're destined for global dominance. And that really depends on whether or not, as Elon Musk says, they get AI right before other people do. That, for me, is a big question. Thank you, Ian Bremer. <laughs> Liz Economy, on the resolution, China is destined for regional dominance. Do you clear yes or no? No surprise. I'm a no. Uh, I think destined is a big word, and it demands a big commitment, and I'm not prepared to make uh, that commitment. I see three significant impediments uh, to China uh, becoming the dominant regional power. First, right now the U.S. is uh, the dominant military power, uh, as General Petraeus said, by an order of magnitude, and it has, no, has demonstrated no indication of, of being interested in abdicating uh, that position. Uh, second, in economic terms, although China is a very important player in the region and indeed the largest trading partner for most of the countries, it is an inconsequential source of foreign direct investment uh, for all the countries in the region except for Laos, uh, Cambodia, and Myanmar, uh, which I think many people would find surprising. And then third goes back to exactly what David said, and that is that uh, nobody else in the region wants China to be the dominant regional power. Uh, and so you have uh, India and uh, Japan and Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, Australia, all working together uh, and in concert with the United States on occasion to ensure that that does not happen. Thank you, Liz Economy. <laughs> the resolution, China is destined for regional dominance. Noah Feldman, are you yes or no? You know, on the one hand, you have three brilliant area experts, and on the other hand, you have the possibility of a real conversation. So uh, I'm going to go with yes. Um, and I'll, I'll Noah Feldman, you, we are very grateful. Uh, well, <laughs> you can take the law professor out of the law school, but... Uh, so, look, global dominance, I do not think, is an inevitable destiny for China, because for all the reasons that we've discussed, it is not yet in a position to achieve that. It may never be in a position to achieve that. China, are, China already has regional economic dominance on issue after issue after issue, on country after country after country. Over a long period of time, other countries in the region will still have a desire. There's no question they have a desire to retain a close strategic relationship with the U.S. to protect themselves against China. But that will become increasingly difficult as the U.S. is less and less willing to provide that and no longer sees the benefits of doing that. I would say the Trump administration's policy here is the leaning edge of what may be a 50 or 75 year change in American attitudes. Take the question of whether the US would at present use military force to defend Taiwan. If in your hearts you think the answer to that question is no, then the answer to this question is yes. Thank you very much, Noah Feldman. And you know, Noah, be because you're such a good sport to take the other side on this one solo, I'm going to, if, if you'd like to continue your thought, I'm going to give you another minute to go with it and then give us, uh, your opponent, something to chew on. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please do. Uh, no? Okay, so we'll go back to Noah. What does it mean to say that um, China has regional economic dominance? What does that mean in your mind? It means that China is the largest and most significant trading partner of every country uh, in the region, broadly defined. Um, that means that its economic leverage over those countries is enormous. Um, it means that capital flows in both directions are great and growing. Um, it means that the um, cultural influences that come with greater economic exchange are also going to grow over time. Um, 
And with respect to forms of governance, which we touched on a bit earlier, but I would have loved for us to have a chance to say more about, even though it's true that none of those countries are trying to govern the way that China does, it's also true that the bloom is off the rose of the idea that democracy on the US model is the best way to govern your country. And in that sense, that can be seen as Chinese influence insofar as there's increasing recognition that countries actually can get away with disaggregating political reform from economic reform. I know we would like to say, and David's written a book, saying that that's a short-term thing, and in the long run we'll all see that they are linked. Uh -huh. But I, you know, I'm not so sure about it. You're getting lots of looks of skepticism from Liz economy in particular. Well, I, I, I just want to know, you know, because we can never agree, basically, not on any one of these points. So um, well, I think uh, you know, it's it interesting, right? So uh, no, I, I think um, you know, I'd make two points, I guess. First, uh, whatever China's regional economic power is, it's not enough uh, to persuade uh, the Philippines to change course uh, with regard to the South China Sea, right? So five years or so worth of uh, boycotting uh, Philippine exports, uh, some exports. It's not enough to make uh, South Korea change course on THAAD, right, as they're uh, boycotting Lotte, the major South Korean uh, department store. Uh, and again, China is a very distant third uh, to the European Union and Japan when it comes to uh, investment uh, in Southeast Asia. So, and it's not clear to me at all that uh, China's cultural and political influence is going to flow out of its being a large trading partner, not to mention the fact that with many, many of these countries, it's running a trade surplus, which irritates uh, a lot of these countries. Well, so I'm not sure that I, it endears the countries to China uh, in a way that is going to grant China greater influence. So if there's one lesson to my mind of, of the last century, it's of the US and its dominance, is that dominance does not lead, you can dominate people without endearing yourself to them. Uh, and in fact, to the contrary, dominating people never makes you feel endeared to them. My point is not, I, I completely agree with you that it will always be in the geostrategic interest of the Philippines to protect the South China Sea or of South Korea to try to maintain uh, aerial defenses. My point is they can only do that because of us. Those are only credible positions. The Philippines can only stand up, quote unquote, to China. South Korea can only stand up, quote unquote, to China, if they have us behind them. And if the US over time, this is really my key point, if the US over time ceases to think, and I mean the US as a people, I don't mean foreign policy experts, like you know people around the table. If ordinary people think that it's not in the US interest to put a huge part of our military budget into constructing a military that enables us to defend uh, yeah. Pacific states, no. then these countries will have no choice. They will still feel the same way, but there will be reality that will let's, interfere. Let's, let's put that point on the table for David Shambaugh. The, the, the argument that Noah Feldman is making, and again, David, you was, you're arguing no, China will not be uh, regionally dominant. Noah is saying to the degree that its dominance is hemmed in by us that 30, 50 years from now, he doesn't really see the American people wanting to support military action that costs us in that part of the world to protect countries like Taiwan, Japan, the Philippines, et cetera. Um, what about that premise? I think you need to uh, disaggregate uh, dominance and you need to disaggregate Asia. As I say, I just came back from half a year in Southeast Asia. There, Noah is absolutely correct. Um, China has economic, primary, primarily economic um, dominance. Japan is also a very significant actor. The United States, less so, and declining uh, in Southeast Asia. Northeast Asia, that's not the case at all. Um, but if you look at the other indices of China's regional uh, posture, uh, military, cultural, political, diplomatic, there you don't find anything approaching dominance. Uh, China's not the major diplomatic actor in Asia. Uh, its military, as I think General Petraeus was indicating earlier, and Ian mentioned, is a regional military. It's growing very quickly, and certainly stronger than any other military in the region except the United States, but it's uh, not, uh, they haven't had a war since 1979, and it's un they're an unproven force, I would argue. Political model, I uh, don't see others wishing to emulate that. And culture, does China have soft power? Does the Chinese culture and system travel? Does it have universality in Asia or elsewhere? I'd say very limited. Uh, Ian Bremer. Chinese have been picking up a lot of influence. I mean, Taiwan, Hong Kong, it's very clear that they have effective dominion over that in a way that the Americans would not have ceded even 10 years ago. And I think over the coming 10 years, there'll be other countries that we feel that way about. Pakistan may well be one. Certainly many of the Southeast Asians, Singapore is quite concerned as a consequence. But there are two reasons that I really don't buy the idea that this is destined. One is not the economics. If, it was, if Asia was just about economics, I'd feel much more comfortable with this formulation. 
certainly with the fact that the Chinese can write really big checks and they can bring the whole apparatus of the state together with it. But the fact is that unlike the United States, which is surrounded by Canada, Mexico, and big bodies of water, Asia is geopolitically fraught, and it's only going to become more so going forward. And so I think the idea that China is going to be able to be regionally dominant in a part of the world that's likely to see vastly more conflict going forward, I don't buy it. Second point is a lot of people talk about the coming Chinese century. There's been an American century, now there's a Chinese century. I don't think we do centuries anymore. Destined implies to me the sweep of history where the Chinese are going to be in charge. When I look at China's military in 20 years, I think about things like drone swarms. I think about things like infantry. And I don't know what the balance of power in Asia is going to be look like, but I do know that the idea that China is going to be able to take manifest their plans of building, building over the last 30 years and just plow them through for another 15, I wouldn't put a lot of money in stake at that. So it's possible that they'll get there. If you wanted to bet on any one country in the region being dominant, I'd bet on China, but I wouldn't bet much. I bet much more on the United States still being regionally dominant in the Western Hemisphere. Noah Feldman, so directly to your point, Ian Bremmer is saying that, you th that he thinks the U.S. will hang in. Yeah, I mean, now. I think one thing that, that strikes me across the debate is that my, the views that I'm expressing seem to be more um, skeptical of the U.S. public being willing to sustain a global position of dominance than my, my colleagues seem Could to think. Could we just think. stop you on that? Because you've made that point a few times and haven't directly heard from your opponents. Just go down the line. What's, what's the time frame you're talking about? 30 years? Yeah. Okay. Just down the line, Ian Bremmer, do you think the U.S. public will be willing to sustain its military, the U.S. military presence and that commitment in that part of the world 30 years from now? No enough? way, but it doesn't change any of the points okay. I just made. Okay, Liz Economy? Yes. yes? David Chambaugh? Yes, I think so. Okay, back to you, Nod. Okay, so I, I, I think... <laughs> I, I think either way. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, you know, the subject of our debate tonight isn't, isn't primarily what does the U.S. public think, but I do right. urge people to ask themselves if, the US, if they would support in their hearts or predict that the U.S. would intervene militarily to protect not just Taiwan, but any of the Japan, let's say, yeah, we're talking or about South Korea. Korea. Treaty, sake, right? Japan I mean, is a treaty know. ally. I mean, we are I know. by treaty, and what I'm so you're and, saying and that we will back out of our treaty. Correct. What I'm saying, Liz, what I'm saying is that in the world that we all occupy of formal, formally trained political scientists with a deep knowledge of political science norms, it's impossible to say that the United States would back away from its commitment, which is embodied in a treaty of international law. And what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, if people ask themselves inwardly, would, the, would you support the U.S. doing so, even in the presence of a treaty? I think many people in the room, and many, many people in the country, and a huge number of people who voted for Donald Trump, would say that the answer is, no way, never heard of the treaty, definitely don't care about it. We and if take, that's... We should take a vote right here. <laughs> If we, if we weren't doing this to radio, I wouldn't be averse to, it, to a show of hands. I've actually you know, tried this asking a room full of military people. Everyone says, of course we would defend them. That's why we have a Navy. And then I ask a room Let's full of civilians. Let's do a show of hands. And everybody show. says, first of all, what are you talking about? Like, of course we wouldn't do that. So my, the point that I'm making here is simply that if the U.S. public can't sustain that sort of commitment over the long term, if it doesn't see a clear economic payoff to regional dominance in Asia, for example. That is likely to shift the geostrategy, the geopolitics of the region. And again, in the absence of the U.S. position, China will de facto dominate the region. And this you economy, know, you're going to get the right. last word. Yeah, okay. I just want to make a totally different point, and that is that we have not even raised the possibility that China is not going to be in a position to right. be a regionally dominant power because actually the, its economy is going to collapse, or at least it's going to slow down so significantly that it's not going to be able to continue on the path that it's on. And Ian, you look anxious to make a point, so go Not for really it. anxious. No, I, I, get, I, get, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I agreed with, I agreed with Liz there, but, but I, I just can't see um, the, um, the fa the, if the Americans pull out, to me that does not ensure Chinese dominance. Instead, it makes it much more likely that we're going to have very significant confrontation. The U.S. staying in, I think, helps with stability. Totally agree with that. I hope, by the way, I hope I'm wrong. Oh, you're so all agreeing. Wrong. Okay, well, that's good because that concludes this round of debate on this resolution. China is destined for regional dominance. Ladies and gentlemen, we have worked through all four of our resolutions for this evening, and before you head for the exits, I just, I, I actually want to check in with you in terms of how you would have voted uh, had the uh, Wi-Fi been up, but I want to do that a little bit low-tech, but before we do that, there are a couple of things I want to say. First of all, I want to, once again, 
um, thank David Petraeus and Max Boot for the opening. They were terrific at that. Um, and normally we bring to the stage the chairman of Intelligence Squared, whose vision it was uh, back in 2006 to bring this forum to New York and to the United States. Um, and he wasn't able to, we had so many moving parts that he said he would sit it out tonight, but I don't want to let him do that. I want him to stand up and take a bow and thank everybody. <laughs> I, I, I do want to also mention this about Intelligence Squared. Um, what, what, what Robert Rosencrantz put together is actually a nonprofit organization. We work very hard to raise the level of public discourse, to bring people like this to the stage who argue with passion, but with truthfulness, uh, with honesty, with candor, with respect for one another. By the way, I need to congratulate all four of you for the way you did this tonight. Thank you. Forgive this as a commercial, but we rely on contributions from the public, and we would really look for any of you who are, is able to meet, you know, even the small donations make a very big difference when there are enough of you. Um, and you can do that. We have a, a uh, if you t text the word debate to the number 797979, you'll get a link that would let you make a contribution to keep us going and to get us getting bigger and bigger, which is our aspiration. And speaking of that, I want to talk about our upcoming season. Our next debate is going to be September 28th. We are going to Rochester, Minnesota. We're going to be part of the Mayo Clinic's Transform Conference, and we're going to be debating the motion, the U.S. health care system is terminally broken. Um, and then on October 3rd, we're going to be back here in New York. Uh, the motion that night is going to be, Western democracy is threatening suicide. Um, and on that night, it's going to be, we think, a fantastic debate as well. We're going to have the French philosopher Bernard-Henri Lévy and Financial Times columnist Edward Luce arguing for the motion. Uh, against them, we'll have Bloomberg View columnist Clive Crook, who's debated with us before and is spectacular, and the Hoover Institution's uh, Corey Shockey will be arguing against, and we hope that you'll join us for that debate. And uh, as I've made clear, we live on as a podcast and as a radio broadcast. Uh, visit our website at IQ2US to find out, uh, to, to, to get to our podcast. It's also available via our apps uh, on Roku and Apple TV. Just search for IQ2US on those apps, and... Uh, you'll find us, and uh, you can also check in with uh, local, your local uh, public radio station to see when the debates will actually be running. So, you know, I, I, it's, it, we regret that the, that the system went down, but I, my feeling is it, 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 I'd still like to sort of get a sense of the sentiment, and what we're interested in is when minds have been changed, when there's a swing. So I just want to go through maybe a couple of the motions to see if people's minds were changed one way or the other. So go, to going back to the first motion, Trump is making China great again. Just a round of applause. How many people changed their views from thinking yes to thinking no? Just by a round of applause. And how many people went the other way? They started out no and went to, to yes. <laughs> Smaller. Okay. It's, it's, it's really interesting to us to see which way it went. But we're, the, the fact that some of you changed your minds, we... Our goal isn't to change your mind, our goal is to prove that people's minds can be changed, and I congratulate you and thank you for that. And let's just jump to the last one. China is destined for regional dominance, since it was the most recent one we discussed. How many people started out thinking yes and switched to no on that? <laughs> let's see, Noah, how it went in the other direction. Well. <laughs> how did it go in the other direction? Okay, all right. I would say lackluster, but... <laughs> You fought a good fight, Noah Feldman. All four of our debaters fought well. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and being willing to listen, being willing to change your mind, because that is the IQ2 way. I'm John Donvan. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure.